All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we will open up this morning, and uh, let's just be thankful for what God is doing. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we just want to say we're so glad that we're able to be in your house today, Lord. Father, we ask that your presence would be here so that we could leave out of this place uh, changed in some way today, that we will not leave here the same way that we came. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, lift burdens that we're carrying around, Lord. Father, change us to be uh, uh, better uh, parents to our children and children to our parents, and a better friend, a uh, better co-worker, someone that others can come and uh, lean on, Lord, if, uh, if they need, Lord. Father, we just uh, worship you today, and Lord, Father, we turn our attention to you. We set everything else aside, and Father, I just pray that today we that you would receive our worship and our thanks, Father, because we are truly grateful for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
applies to him. The Bible says if there was so, if there was everything was written down that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it all. We just have a smallest little glimpse into what Jesus did. You guys ready?
just welcome him in this place this morning. to us that you mean business, Father, that you will keep your word. And so, Father, we call Jesus our Savior this morning. He is alive, and Lord, we follow him every day. And Father, we pledge ourselves to be 
his disciples to learn the scriptures to follow and conduct our lives according to his example. And so, Lord, today I just pray that as we open your scriptures, as we look into your word, Lord, show us how to walk that path. Lord, show us how to, uh, how to do it and to follow after you with all of our hearts. Father, we love you and we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We get up early enough as it is. All right. Um, John, that singing service that we have, we have it at the end of the last Sunday of every month. Okay. Just at regular church time. And uh, since we don't, since I don't have an assistant pastor right now, Sheila, my wife, said, you need to take a break once in a while. Mm -hmm. So we started doing singing service. As one way is just give me a break from having to right. serve every Sunday. Um, but it's kind of like an open mic time. Anybody wants to praise the Lord and share a testimony or a, a song or a talent or whatever can come and and uh, and share what's on their heart. The little ones can do it if they want to. And you know, if you got a message on that day, swing by. <laughs> that is a good chance to let everybody kind of get a sample of of some. A little word that might be on your heart, you know, but that's that'd be that'd be a good time to come by and right. visit us again, perhaps if you'd like to. Uh, let's see. And um, something I was something's come on my heart. We've been we've been talking about this for a while, and I was talking to some of the guys in the church this morning um, before, you know, the ones that got here real early. Um, we know that for us to be able to grow, we're going to have families that come to have younger kids that come in. And so it used to be Megan was young, and we had we had Sunday school for young kids. Now everybody is in the youth age, so we have the youth age. But we're going to have to have and provide something for the younger kids again. And uh, John has a five five year old, and so she went to the church with her sister this morning. I think that's great. But I, I, I'm saying this now because I'm. Just want to get a head nod from everybody, and also John can know this. Behind this wall back here is another office that was previously occupied by someone that did uh, taxes or something. And when COVID hit, they closed their business. It's a it's just a single room; it doesn't have a restroom. So the landlord, I imagine, will have a difficult time renting it again because he used to, when this used to be a this used to be a beauty salon, and he would come over and use their bathroom. But now, since we're out here through the week, he you know. Landlord asked me, I was like, well, you know, we're not there during the week, it's whatever. So, anyways, um, I was going to contact the landlord and see if we could maybe rent that room in addition to what we have here and then maybe add a door and maybe a window or something so we could have younger kids mm -hmm. in that room. So, there's kind of a chicken and egg thing when you grow. you you got to make the space so that people can come, but, you you know, you got to have people coming and... So we've been we've been kind of holding off having that conversation, but that is something we're planning that's in the works. So mm -hmm. we need to we've got some more people now, and uh, with Rachel and Sheila are in there together with the girls. But maybe since we got two teachers, if we had two age groups, we could accommodate that. Mm -hmm. So just trying to grow and follow the Lord until He wants. But mm -hmm. is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, well, I'll talk with the landlord this week and see what the story is, and hopefully. You know, we'll try and charge double because that's a small space compared to what we already have. So we'll see. All right, anybody got anything they'd like to share or say before we go into the sermon today? All right, well, we have been doing a sermon series since the start of the year called My People. And uh, today is the conclusion of that sermon series. And the title for today is... God's people serve Him in good times. Everybody say good times. Sometimes people have this concept that God is like a spare tire. You only pull Him out of the trunk when you got problems and you need to call on Him. But we need to think about always serving Him in the good times. Scripture at times alludes to that when times are bad... That's when we follow the Lord and when times are good. That's when some of the Old Testament stories, when times were good, people forgot about the Lord. It's like, well, we don't need Him now. And uh, so it's, you know, if I kind of have this concept in my mind and it seems to have worked in my life 
that God puts me through the challenges that I need to go through to learn the lessons I haven't learned yet. And if I'm being hard-headed about learning a lesson, like forgiveness, if I have trouble with forgiveness, then it seems like I'm always put in these situations where I have to forgive somebody because they hurt me. But you know, as soon as I learned that I learned, God, I'm just going to start forgiving people, then I start having less problems because I didn't need to learn that lesson anymore. And uh, so uh, there is some, there that maybe there is something to that, that if we serve him in the good times, we'll have more good times. Because if we need bad times to keep us closer to the Lord, I'm sure he's happy to accommodate us. You know, hey, you need, you need, you need some tribulation to, to, to pray? Well, my golly, I've got some of that up my sleep, you know. I think there's some truth to that. So it's a good lesson to learn and, and, uh, and a good topic for us to conclude on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get into the uh, sermon for the day. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we come to you today and as we open up your word and look into your scriptures, Lord, I pray that you would plow the fields of our heart. Lord, we should have already had our soil turned over and made everything ready, but Lord, I pray that as we look into your word, you let that seed be planted in our heart, let it take good root and find good anchor in the soil, good nourishment. And Lord, I uh, pray that it would grow and bring harvest in our lives. Father, I just uh, rebuke the enemy that would come and try to steal the word away. And Lord, uh, Father, we just uh, pray that you would uh, help us to mix the word with faith that it would profit us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to take a quick look back over our past sermons for this sermon series. We started on January 3rd just with the introduction, My People. And the key thought for that sermon was in the scripture that says, I will be your God and you will be my people. Amen. That is a binding agreement between God and mankind to those who enter into it. He will never break his word. He will always stand firm to us. But we are the weak ones. We are the ones that sometimes go astray and go against our commitment to that relationship with God. And it's like a wedding. When you go and you get married, you make your vows, and what happens? Sometimes we're not faithful to our vows, and it's a sad thing. But God loved us so much that he actually wanted to save that marriage. He knew that we were not able to follow the Old Testament laws completely. It's just not humanly possible to do that. And so he made a new covenant with us and saved that marriage through that new covenant. So that was, that was the first introduction. My people, January 3rd. The second <laughs> sermon in the series was called The Name of the Lord. And you might remember that we talked about the names of God. God has a name, Jesus has a name, and the Holy Spirit has a name. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament, there was a descriptive name and there was an actual name. Descriptive name was something like Adonai or El Shaddai, El Elohim Israel. Those were his descriptive names, but then he came out and he finally revealed. He said, my name is Jehovah or Yahweh, depending on how you translate that to English. But God has a name, a descriptive name and an actual name. Jesus, he was the son of man. He was Emmanuel, God with us, and many descriptive names. But then the angel Gabriel told Mary, you shall call his name Jesus, the real name. And the Holy Spirit, we know he's the spirit of truth, the comforter. He has descriptive names, and he also has a name, but we don't know what it is yet. You look at Revelation, and it says he'll be given us a stone and in that stone will be my new name Amen. and no one will know that name except those who are followers of Christ so even the Holy Ghost has a name we just, it has not been revealed in scripture as of yet and the name of the name that someone has uh, is our call sign and how are you called <laughs> if I call John <laughs> you might respond to that name. hey John what's that what's going on if someone says, hey, David, I'm going to look around, or 
whatever. That'd be my real name. Sometimes they say, hey, pastor. Well, that's my descriptive name now. And I'm like, oh, oh you're talking about me. Oh, okay. And so that is how we are called. But when we are called by God's name, that is where we hear a conversation going on, maybe in our off place of work or maybe in the grocery store, and we hear two people talking about God, and all of a sudden we are drawn to that. We are called to that. Because like, oh, I know him, and he's my Savior too. And so we are called by the name of Jesus. So they can say, hey, David, but if they say, hey, Jesus, I'm like, where, where? That's where I want to be. That's the name of the Lord. That was their sermon too, January 10th. God's people. Now, on January 17 and 24, we had a two-parter that God's people are humble. And the scripture example that we gave in the first of uh, the two-parter sermon, we look back in the Old Testament to this guy named Ahab, a very wicked king of Israel. You might remember he, he used to hang out with his lady Jezebel. Boy, she was a nice influence. The scripture said that there was no one else who had devoted himself so completely to doing wrong in the Lord's sight as Ahab. It's in 1 Kings. This guy was worse than anybody else. Nobody had devoted themselves to doing so much evil and doing wrong. And yet there was a moment that came that the prophet brought a prophecy from God. And he tore his clothes and he wore that sackcloth and ashes and did all those things to humble himself. And God was so impressed. He said, hey, Elijah, can you believe this guy? He said, because of his humility, the worst guy that was ever, ever an example of somebody that did something wrong. And God said, because he was humble, I'm going to spare his kingdom from, from destruction until the end of his lifetime. So he spent, even though he was a, the worst guy, for serving God. I mean, he just did the worst things imaginable. Even God forgave him. So if God can forgive the worst guy when we are humble, imagine how God can treat us. If he treated the worst guy with and gave him mercy, how will God give us? God's people, we got to be humble before him. And in that part two, we talked about Jesus at the Last Supper washed the disciples' feet. And we had our first foot washing service here on that on that Sunday. Our church is 10 years old. We've never had a foot washing here, but we did on that January 24th. We hope to do that more in the future. Because that, that is how we can be humble with one another. Jesus said, you will wash one another's feet. Communion was just, hey, whenever you get around to it, it was communion was actually kind of more of a suggestion. But when it came to foot washing, he says, you will wash one another's feet. And that's because he wants us to be humble. God's people are humble. Next sermon was February the 7th. God's people pray. And basically we set the record straight. Sometimes you hear folks pray, dear Jesus, and they'll say the prayer. And I'm not critical, but the scripture tells us, even Jesus said, pray to the Father in my name. Ask anything in my name and God will do it because he himself loves us. And so we pray to the Father in Jesus' name. And we have to do it with the right motives. This scripture, you know, why aren't your prayers being answered? You're praying with the wrong motives. And in the book of James, well, uh, you have to pray in faith, nothing wavering. Because he that is wavers is like tossed about with the sea and the waves. And don't let that man think he shall get any from, from the Lord. So when we pray, we have to believe in faith. And then we talked about praying and singing in the Spirit and singing and praying and understanding also. Sometimes you just have to use an unknown tongue and let your spirit pray to God. That was February 7th. Then on Valentine's Day, February 14th, God's people will seek His face. You know, when you go through some real desperate times, we start trying to, you know, get score some brownie points with God. We start talking about fasting and everything, and but we've got to do it right. If you want to really impress God, the Lord says, this is the type of fast I have chosen. He said, stop making trouble for others and undo the damage 
caused by your words and actions and help those that are in need. And, and of course, he goes into details about clothing the hungry and feeding the, uh, feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and so on. All those things that we're supposed to. He said, you want to you touch God's heart? You want to seek his face? Do those things. Fasting, fasting is good, but you got to do it the right way. you got to include those other things. There's so many people that are, what was the word he used? Church damaged? Church damaged. Church hurt. Church hurt. Church hurt. We've met so many folks like this at Comic Cons. And that's one of the hardest things about our ministry is because they look at us and they say, oh, you're just like some other judgmental Christians we met. And, you know, that's the hardest part of this ministry. And when we go into those places is to convince them that there's different kind of Christians out there. It's a hard thing to overcome. And so that's why he says... You want to oppress God, you want to get my attention, go and undo the damage. We are working so hard to undo as much of that damage as possible that the church has inflicted on people with church hurt. New, new vocabulary word, I'm practicing. <laughs> church hurt. I'm only talking about being out of five words. Hey, oh, that's all right. We got it. Last Sunday, February the, I'm sorry, last Sunday we had a sermon before the last singing service, uh, February 21st. The sermon was God's people turn from wicked ways. And the culmination of that little sermon was where there was a scripture in the Old Testament that says, even the prophet and the priest do wickedly and in God's house. Not anyone is immune from stepping out on God or doing wrong. <laughs> if we ever get to a point where we say, hey, I, I have a, I'm, I'm not sinning anymore. I'm, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I just don't sin anymore. You are a liar. You just, you just sin because of a lie. <laughs> and if the prophet and the priest and the preacher can fall, every one of us can fall. And uh, But... But then there's the hope and the promise that God gives us that if a wicked man turns from his sins and does none of the transgressions, I'm sorry, if he turns from his sins, none of his transgressions which he has committed will be remembered against him. That's an Old Testament promise, and it's the same one we have today because we can put it under the blood. That's that new covenant. So that was our sermon series up till now. We are God's people and we do these things. We are called by His name. We are humble. Or we ought to be. And we pray. Or we ought to. And we seek His face. Or we ought to do it the right way. And we turn from wicked ways. Or by golly, we ought to. And today we're going to talk about serving God in good times. God's people serve Him in the good times. We don't wait until we are in dire, desperate situations to call on God, or we shouldn't if we do. Mm -hmm. it, ought to be, it ought to be something that's part of our daily vocabulary. Mm -hmm. If you don't pray every day, we should pray every day. If we don't, if we're not humble, we should make it our practice to be humble. I mean, we're living in America. God has set this place and created this place and I am so blessed to have been born in the United States of America where you can get up and go to church on Sunday morning if you want to. You don't have to worry about the police standing outside the door checking your papers. Oh, are you allowed to be in here? You know, oh well, you're not a member of the party. You're not allowed to come in, all that kind of stuff. Or only four people can congregate at one time and we're going to watch you while you do it, you know. Uh, there's some bad places in the world to live, and I'm so grateful that we live in the greatest country in the face of the earth. But we live in good times. There may come a time when it's not so good times as we have now. The Bible tells us to seek the Lord while he may be found. So before we endure bad times that will inevitably come to everyone, while we're still in good times, we should do, be doing all these things. We should be humble every day. We should pray every day. We should seek His face all the time. And we should definitely turn from our wicked ways as soon as we are aware of them. Not wait until the bad times come, but serve Him in good times. And for Scripture verse today, uh, 
We've actually got just really one big scripture verse. That's in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. But I put I divided it into three sections here. And then there's a few extra scriptures that we can do at the end. Just by show of hands, who'd like to help me read our scriptures today? Randy? Wendy? Just two? All right. Who'd like to take that first section? 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Randy, go ahead. Read from, it's on the left, and then it goes up to the top of the right page. Read until you hit that line. When Solomon finished praying, the fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. <coughs> then the king and all the people offered sacrifices to the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. And so the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their assigned positions and so did the Levites who were singing His faithful love endures forever. They accompanied the singing with music from the instruments King David had made for praising the Lord. Across from the Levites, the priests blew the trumpets while all Israel stood. What we are reading about here is what is, without a question, the best times of the nation of Israel. The good times. Everybody say good times. <laughs> for two generations... The nation of Israel had been focused on pretty much one thing. They had, they had problems they had to deal with, national interests and fighting off Philistines and whatever they had to do. But there was two generations that <coughs> focused on one thing. And that one thing was building God's <laughs> temple in the city of Jerusalem. Started with King David. After they, you know, he killed Goliath, they killed tens of thousands of Israel's enemies and the wars and everything like that. David was anointed king and David purposed in his heart to build God's house. And God said, God said, hey David, you just, you, you know, I love you, but you've, you've had to kill enough people. He said, you got blood on your hands. So he said, he said, you're not allowed to build your temple, but your son will. And he says, well, that's all right, God. I'm not going to be able to build the temple, but I can go get all the stuff. I can make all the trips to Lowe's and pile it up right here. So when the son takes over, he's ready to go. And they went and chopped down the giant trees, the cedars of Lebanon. And they went and got stones from this quarry. And they went and got gold and stuff and brought it all into the, into the treasuries and everything. Got everything ready. And for one generation... King David gathered the materials to build the temple. And then Solomon, his son, who had taken over the kingdom after the death of his father, and, and he prayed. You might remember the story where he, where he prayed. God appeared to him in a dream, and he says, What do you want? I'll give you anything. And he said, God, just give me the wisdom so that I can judge your people. And God not only gave him the wisdom that he asked for, but he gave him riches and glory and honor and everything else the king would deserve because his heart was in the right place. He had the right motives. And so one generation, King David, they gathered all the materials, and then the second generation, Solomon, went to work. And they started building and building and building. And the, the construction that they did, part of it is still standing in Israel today. Thousands of years later, there is still a place called the Western Wall, and that is part of the original temple that Solomon helped to build. They, it was rebuilt when they returned from, from occup being, basically being captured and led away. They came back to Israel, rebuilt the temple, but part of that is still standing to this day. It was the high point for the nation of Israel. You might think, well, what's the high point for like the United States of America? You know, we've built a lot of different things. You might think, oh, well, you know, the Washington, D.C., and it stands. Or you might think, oh, something like Mount Rushmore or something. So, you know, these things take generations to build. What would be the big accomplishment? Well, you can name it for Israel. It was this temple because everything was devoted to serving God and having God's presence in their midst. 
So here we are in 2 Chronicles, and the day has finally come. They have finished all the construction. They have got everything ready to go. Maybe a few finishing touches here and there, but they are ready to start the purpose of what this building was all about. It was to, it was to basically begin to offer the sacrifices prescribed in the Old Testament in the law of Moses that their sins were forgiven when they would make these sacrifices. They would do the offerings. The priests would do the work that God had called them to do. And they started doing it here on day one. We're reading out of the uh, New Living Translation, and aren't you glad because they actually put numbers in there like numbers. 22,000 cattle. I don't think there's that many cattle in the whole state of Texas. I mean, 22,000 cows... How many steaks is that? Man, that is a lot of beef. Yeah. Can you imagine Can you imagine being and looking around and seeing 22,000 cows all in one place and they're sacrificing? Get a load of this. You thought 22,000 was a lot of animals. 120,000 sheep. Now, we got sheep that live right across the street from our house. Sometimes we open up the curtains and look and they're over there dancing around and oh, they're just wonderful to watch. Sheep and goats, too. They're just... Saw them one morning, we woke up, and there's somebody that built two little piles of dirt in there, and they were running into one pile of dirt, and it was like king of the hill, and then when they get all over there, and they'd run back to the other one, get to the top of it. Well, they're fun to watch. <laughs> Love that. 120,000 of them. They had rack of lamb and goat and just anything you could want off these animals. They had 120,000. That's a lot of goats and sheep. And 22,000 cattle. And they brought them to the temple and they sacrificed them. This was what the temple was built to do because under the old covenant, the, and there was no, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And boy, they shed a lot of blood. If you've never been to where you've seen the animal slaughtered, I don't recommend it. It's not for a week of starving. But this was life. This was the most wonderful thing that any of these people had ever seen because what it was is God's words coming to life. We get excited about Bible prophecy these days and when we see something in the news, it's like, oh, wow, look, that's God's word coming to life. There was an asteroid. Was it just last night? or It was over the weekend. It's an asteroid to pass by. Pretty significant to Bible prophecy. That's going to swing around a couple more times. But it made it pretty close past it. And I, well, I got excited about that. But this was something really that got, their, that got them rolling. To see all these animals sacrificed. To see the priest there. To see the king and dedicating this temple. This was the pinnacle the high point for Israel, the building of the temple was the highest achievement of the nation of Israel. Two generations bring it to pass, and I'm sure everybody out there was just so, felt so incredibly fortunate to have been born to live to see this day in the nation of Israel. Verse 7, next section. When do you want to take those 7 to 10 there? Solomon then consecrated the central area of the courtyard in front of the Lord's temple. He offered burnt offerings and the fat of peace offerings there, because the bronze altar he had built could not hold all of the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sacrificial fat. For the next seven days, Solomon and all Israel celebrated the festival of shelters. A large congregation had gathered from far away. On the eighth day, they had a closing ceremony, ceremony where they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days, in the festival of shelters for seven days. Then at the end of the celebration, Solomon sent the people home. They were all joyful and glad because the Lord had been so good to David and to Solomon and to his people Israel. This, um, this construction of the altar, I'm sure they were planning it out. They had them a target they had set. The dedication of this temple happened and it aligned up with a festival in Israel that God instituted all the way back in the Exodus. And the actual name of it is called the Sukkot. 
And here it's translated the festival of shelters, but if you're a Bible scholar, you might recognize it by the name of Feast of Tabernacles. And what this was in the Old Testament was where they would build temporary shelters and they would close it up. Sometimes it was just like a teepee and they'd close it up and they would pray. But by this time in Israel's history, this was a pilgrimage. They were commanded to come to Jerusalem at different times in their life. There were three different pilgrimages and the Feast of Tabernacles was one when they would come because it celebrated the harvest. You... you Sometimes see ministries that will talk about harvest celebration. Bringing in the sheaves. We had a little harvest festival here. You know, that was a lot of fun with uh, uh, all the fall things you do. Why do people celebrate harvest? Harvest is when the abundance of God's blessing has all been gathered up. Everything that grew all through the summer, if you plant in a garden, harvest is when you got all, you start canning those tomatoes or whatever you do with them. And there is an abundance. Everything that you've grown has now been brought in from the field. There is an abundance of everything. What you've got to live on for all the winter is right here in front of you. Everything that God has blessed you with your increase is all right here. And so that was a celebration in and of itself to celebrate God's goodness. Okay. Well, now this, now this celebration is lining up with the temple. So they had so much to celebrate and be thankful for. They got the temple, and now here is all the abundance. They got all these cows, they got all these sheep, everything that has grown and multiplied and all their increase, everything they tied on or whatever, is all right here. And they are celebrating it. And it said that they came from a large congregation from far away. I took out the place names because they just were so hard to pronounce. But they were from the whole nation of Israel. They had come on their pilgrimage here to the temple. And it was a celebration that lasted seven days. What a celebration of party that was. You think about going to, uh, you know, back before COVID, you'd go to Times Square on New Year's Eve. You know, they'd have those streets would all be full, 50,000 people. They'd have Dick Clark out there or whoever replaced him. Who was the guy from? Uh, Ryan Seacrest. Brian Seacr Brian, Ryan Seacrest, yeah. thank you, yes. Yeah, it's a good show. I like to watch that still. But you think about all the people in Times Square, that was nothing compared to what was here. I mean, there was people as far as they could see. How many people does it take to eat 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep in seven days? That's how many people they had. Lots. You know, when they sacrificed these animals, they didn't just throw the meat away. They were supposed to burn the fat and the entrails on, you know, take the entrails out, burn the fat. But the animals was actually the eighth animals. That was part of it. The Levites would eat the animals, but when they had one of these celebrations like this, everybody was eating. It was a, it was an all-you-could-eat buffet for seven days. Man, I hope they don't forget to invite me next time. That is, <laughs> man, I like I like a good prime rib or something. I always said if I got rich, I hope to be the same person I am today. But I would eat more prime rib. That's what I'm saying. Oh man. Oh. I can't, it's, it's just unbelievable the celebration that was going on. But this was the Feast of Tabernacles, or also called the Festival of Shelters, or also called the Sukkot. Then the word Sukkot is actually the name for that temporary shelter. So when people would come, and there was, you know, millions of people that would come to that area, there wasn't enough Motel 6s to put them all up. People had to basically, they're camping, and they bring and they build their temporary shelter, a Sukkot. Sukkot, and just, you know, just temporary lean-to or whatever you might think, a temporary thing, and that's where they were. I mean, I wasn't around for uh, uh, Woodstock, but you might think it would be like a, a you know, a, a Jehovah Woodstock or something like that. I mean, they, they were just everywhere, camping everywhere, celebrating, because God is good. God is great. His faithful love endures forever. And they would celebrate. I'll read verse 11, unless we have another reader. Anybody else want to read? Verse 11. So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord, as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. And then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon. I don't know if it's a dream or physical appearance or whatever. 
But he came to the Solomon by night, and he appeared, and he said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. At times, I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, or command grasshoppers to devour your crops and send plagues among you. Then, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. And I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart, saith the Lord. If you've been coming to the My People Sermon series since January, and you haven't figured out that I was connecting it to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, then surprise, that's, what, that's where this verse is the one that this whole sermon series is based around. And you know, when you read this verse in the scripture, it is quoted quite a lot. Usually it is quoted when it's the deepest, darkest, most troubling times. If you were on the wrong side of an election, for example, on uh, this last election, you probably heard it a lot, and you probably even said it a couple of times. Bad times are coming. But I want to point out just what I said at the beginning of the sermon, and that is we need to be doing all these things not when... We don't just need to break out God like he's a spare tire. Amen, brother. We don't need to start quoting this verse when times is bad. That's the way most people quote this verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, <laughs> then I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. So the land needs to be healed. And so, my gosh, we better get on the job. We better start praying. We better start, we better start humbling ourselves. You know what I'd say it's too late. No, it's not too late, but you should have been doing it a lot sooner. <laughs> this was the best of times. This wasn't a disaster facing Israel. This wasn't terrible times coming. This was the pinnacle of this entire kingdom, the highest achievement. This was the best of times. Everybody say good times. <laughs> this was the goodest times that Israel ever had. And that's when this verse appears in the scripture, not when it's bad times, when it's good times. He says, at times I might shut up the heaven so no rain falls. If you grow in a garden, it's awful, you know, not to get any in any rain because, you know, your ground starts drying out and it cracks and then your plants boom, fall over and you don't get any vegetables, right? Well, you know what? God's not picking on you. Because you know what? If you look across the street and your neighbor's house, he might not be a Christian, but you know what? His, his is falling over too. Ground's cracked probably at your neighbor's house too. He says in Matthew 45 and 44 and 45, it says, Love your enemies, pray for those that persecute you, and in that way you will be acting like the children of your Father in heaven. He gives his sunlight both to the evil and good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. You know, you can talk about God using the weather to punish somebody, and I'm not going to say that doesn't happen. But you know what? We live in a world where sometimes we just have a dry season. Sometimes we have plagues of locusts that come. If you don't believe me, hang around for about three months. We're about to be covered in those 17 years cicadas. They'll be everywhere. You thought 2020 had all these bad things happen? You'd see it on Facebook. It's like, oh, oh, here, murder hornets are coming. Oh, well, look at all these bad things happen. You thought 2021 was bad? You just wait until the month of April, end of May, end of April, and the beginning of May. You won't be able to go outside without hearing anything. You're going to have to cover your ears. It's going to be so loud. Rear, 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 rear. You remember those things? You remember when we was little, we'd crunch around and play with all those little skeletons everywhere? Well, guess what? This is the year. <laughs> I'm going to 
start making me some memes now and get ahead of the curve, you know? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> What was that little, was it the Dr. Evil meme, or what was it? It was, uh, it's like, oh, they're not believing the, this scandal. We'll call out the murder hornets. Yeah, I love those little memes. That's great. We got, they're, gonna, they're still going to be going this year. Sometimes it's just dry season, and sometimes the insects are going to come out of the hole. They didn't realize back in these days, probably, that those things had cycles. We have solar cycles, and we have weather cycles, and we have, uh, you know, these... Uh, Ocean water warms up and cools off. They're figuring out that cycles now and all that. <coughs> they just thought, oh, God's punishing us. But he says, God says, at times I might shut up the heavens. Well, you know, that, that happens. Even, even, even the insurance company calls things acts of God. I thought insurance companies didn't believe in God. But you know what they do? If something bad falls in your house, they say, oh, we can't pay. That's an act of God. <laughs> right? Well, that's what they thought. They thought all these things were acts of God. And in a sense, they are because God creates the weather. But, you know, most of the time, I don't think he's picking on people. These things happen. And he says, at times, these things might happen. He says, I might even send plagues among you. Guess what? Got them, got those cicadas coming. But he says... Then if my people who is called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and restore their land. You know, basically what he's saying is if you people are doing what you're supposed to be doing as God's people, everything's going to be okay because God is watching out. And God is taking care of us, the just and the unjust. God loves his children. But this verse is not meant to pull out just when disaster is striking. Just when you think that you're under the microscope and you're under the hammer and the hammer is coming down. That's not the time to start scrambling around like the Keystone Cops. Woo, 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 woo. we got to start praying. We should be doing this all the time. <laughs> we should be doing all the time. God's people serve him in good times. Everybody say good times. <laughs> this is when we need to serve God. And the temple. Let me end on the temple. Solomon finished the temple. This was the crowning achievement of the nation of Israel. Two generations of work now come to fruition. Everything is done. And Solomon's looking at it. And he's thanking the Lord. And God visits him. And he says, My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. Now they had a temple made of stone and precious jewels and precious metals and things overlaid in gold and those huge old cedars of Lebanon to make the doors and decorations and they cast gold to make their altars and their silverware and utensils and all the stuff that they needed for the sacrifices and for carrying out the job. They had all that as a temple. Something wonderful to look at. Even Jesus was taken up to the temple, to the high, to the temple, basically tempted by, by Satan. took his disciples there and he said, look at all this wonderful place and there's going to come a time where one stone is not going to be left on another. They had the physical material that they could touch and feel. A building, a great temple. And it was proper for that time. But the temple that we deal with today is quite a different place. And no, it's not these four walls that we have here. It's not the sheetrock and the paint and the pretty red curtains and it's not that. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, I'll close with this. It says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for you. God bought you with a high price and you must honor God with your body. In this temple, God will hear our prayers. If they come straight from your heart, 
and you're sincere with the Lord, and you're serving God in good times, God is open to our cries. If we trust in the Lord and we do what we're supposed to do day by day, everything's going to be okay. You don't have to break out that scripture verse and start, start running around. You just keep it steady. Walk with the Lord day by day. Serve Him in good times. And God is with us. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just uh, pray today that as we close the book on this sermon series, Lord, that you will help us to be humble always. When we start to see ourselves getting puffed up, and it happens, Lord, help us to bring our body into submission, to get under it and pull it down and bring it into subjection. Lord, help us to pray. Lord, if we see ourselves going for a couple of days and we realize, you know, I haven't said my prayers. I haven't talked to you today, Lord. I pray that you would, Lord, soften our hearts and tender us, Lord. Remind us, Father, to spend some time with you in a prayer closet, time away from everything else, to make time from a busy day, and to spend time with you because I know you're anxiously waiting to hear from us. And Father, if we have gone a long time without taking a look at where we are and maybe how far we've strayed from you. And Lord, Father, I pray that it would not take something bad to remember to seek your face, Lord. Father, we want to learn the lesson before you have to teach it to us. And so, Lord, I ask, Father, that you would keep us in remembrance to seek your face, Lord. To help the hurting person, Lord, to help the one who is in hunger, Lord. Help us to remember to feed them. Father, when we see someone that is without clothing that they need, Lord, help us to remember to clothe them. Lord, if we have caused damage to someone else, Lord, I pray that we would not be able to let that go very long before we do something to correct the damage. Lord, help us to correct the damage that has already been done to people with the church hurt, Lord. Father, when we examine ourselves and we see that some wickedness has crept in at us, Lord, we go about our day and we realize, oh my gosh, I can't believe what thought just entered into my mind or what word just came out of my mouth and how wicked it is, Lord. Father, let us not go the rest of that day without being completely uh, uh, convicted and, Lord, to get that thing out of us, to ask your forgiveness and to get our feet back on the right path. Lord, to serve you in the good times. Lord, we want to learn these lessons so that we don't have to go through the bad times to learn them. Lord, help us to learn these lessons before the bad times arrive. Lord, when the bad times, if they come or when they come, Lord, let us remember that we just hang on to you and hold on to your faithful hand because everything's going to be okay and you will lead us through it. Lord, we, we're serving you in the good times and we will continue to serve you in the bad times. And Father, Lord, we just trust you with everything that we have. We love you. And we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. If anybody desires prayer before we go today, we'll take a time to do that. Uh, just raise your hand and we will pause the service to take time to do that. But I just want to thank everybody for being here and for loving God as you do. Let us take this into the world and share it with others outside these four walls. John, we're so glad to have you here today. Hope you come back and see us again. And uh, see if I have anything they'd like to share now before we, before we, uh, before we conclude and dismiss. All right, well, we, uh, we have, uh, if anybody was planning on going to lunch or something, we have time for a short lunch, but we're going to be on our way to visit my mom this afternoon, so we won't have time to linger really long, but I appreciate, you, appreciate everybody. Hope you have a good week, and y'all come back to the Lord's house next Sunday. God bless you.